somehow missed it. I think last year I missed it. Oh, so Penny is in there and, and Ralph Larson. You know, many of them are gone and I still feel their names. So I've been donating. <laughs> Well, I'm waiting for the tech crew to get ready. I'm going to walk by and let you envision being on the Mink River uh, drainage basin here. So Raleigh, Raleigh's base over here. The Foundry Farm is here on 42. But gives you a different appreciation for uh, how important this estuary is. It will is. be on the screen. It will be on the screen. Okay, well, see, I'm old school. <laughs> <laughs> this is a historical society, anyway, right? I just love this aerial view. All set? Yeah. Well, welcome everybody. Tonight we're going to learn about the people that lived in this area for hundreds of years. And it's a story of kinship, storytelling, and most of us are trying to figure that out in our own lives right now. How do we share with the family? We talked about the bricks. And so this evening what we're talking about is our one Potawatomi artifact a basket made by a Potawatomi woman who traded it with another person in the same area Carolyn Bondre a German immigrant the basket maker whose name we're not sure of at the moment Still looking for it. Traded it. But she lived at the mouth of the Mink River and only with permission of a New York businessman, Sam Rogers. That's why they, the Potawatomi were still living at the mouth of the river. That's the same reason why the German immigrants were there among the other European immigrants. And so our story of kinship is not just the family, uh, the Potawatomi family. It's the intersection between the Potawatomi who were here for hundreds of years, the German immigrants and the other European immigrants who were just arriving in 1859 when the Liberty Grove was being founded, and the Easterners, like New York family of Sam Rogers, and other Americans that are migrating west, go west young man, it was already a theme. And they're all the same family, all the same, we're all human. We all need air, water, food to survive. They had to work together with their family groups and their neighbors to survive. But the Potawatomi also had all the same uh, emotions and problems that we had, just at maybe at a slower pace, definitely not techie. But um, those are the connections across the years. And when we're talking about the people that Dave is going to introduce tonight, we need to keep that in mind. We're all part of that same kinship. Now. Um, over at the table, I started searching for the Potawatomi last year, and the Potawatomi people did not have a written language. So we have to rely on archeological evidence, the, the folklore and the legends and the storytelling around the campfire generation after generation. And then we also have to rely on the people that met the Potawatomi who lived here, the French fur tra traders, the missionaries from the different religions. And they are going to tell us the story of who the Potawatomi are through their lens, 
through their eyes. And um, not fake news at the time, but they're also going to tell us how to pronounce even the word Potawatomi. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we talk about the people that you, you're going to hear about tonight, um, that you're going to read on the handouts, remember that there are many ways to spell a name if you don't have it in writing. There's no common consensus. So the French fur traders might call you Joe and somebody else may Joe or whatever, you know, depending on where you meet. The, um, other thing that we need to think about is that what do these three groups have in common? They love this part of the country as much as you and I do. And that's probably the most special bond that we can have. The um, one handout with the, the map, the 1899 map of the Mink River is my research that I started wading through last December and then I met my hero Dave Lee who is our special guest today from Fish Creek. He's been searching longer than I have and so his other papers are there as well. The um, important thing is that Dave got his degree in communications and the arts. And so, how did he go after the Potawatomi and the Native Americans? <laughs> Passion, he, he is passionate to find out about the contributions of the Native Americans. Just like I was passionate to find what are the names of the Potawatomi who actually lived in Liberty Grove. Hi. So I was jumping for joy when I came across the evidence in the 1875 Wisconsin Census of Indian Joe and Indian Ben. Two names in writing, part of a, an American governmental document. So it's on the back of the Ellison Bay Liberty Grove archaeological map. A couple of days ago, I was looking through Sam Rogers' 1876 ledger for his store over in Raleigh's Bay, and I met Indian Joe, same guy, he was the oldest of the family, Indian Lewis, and Mosquito Indian. So I'm assuming that Mosquito is probably the youngest of the family, and they would shop at the store. They probably worked for Sam Rogers. The mystery continues, and that's what you guys get to keep looking for. And in the meantime, Dave is going to share some of his research that's a work in progress book called In Search of Simon. Now Simon, you might know from the, what's frequently called the totem pole, the memory pole that used to be at Peninsula State Park. Hmm. Well, Simon Pequados was a very special communicator, and that's who we're going to meet tonight, thanks to Dave's research. And so welcome, Dave. And I will turn off the lights. Or you want to keep them on for a few minutes? Oh, you turn them on so that I can see the screen now. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate so much what Karen has done on her own in the, in the space of about a year. It really is a very, very deep subject. There's lots and lots to learn. And uh, I'll just start with my own presentation. This is just, um, and let me know if it sounds too loud, if it's distorted. It's too soft. It's too soft. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can get it right here. Can everybody hear okay? Yep, my wife's going to tell us. <laughs> She's the, the one with the hardest to hear. Now, uh, this is a focusing on Simon Onanguse Coquetos. And I, I pronounce the A as an A sound because in many places you'll find an E at that spot. 
which is the German letter A. So there are a lot of Germans that were reporting. Also one of the Potawatomi, the young man, informed me that that's the way you should pronounce it because there's no H behind that A. Now this poll was something that I thought was very out of place because I knew very well that the, uh, the, the Indians of the East did not have the kind of totem pole that is so enigmatic you know, in the West. So uh, when I was in, I, I joined the uh, Gibraltar Historical Association in about uh, 2015, and we had regular talks. There was a gap in our talk schedules for 2017. I learned in January of that year, and I said, well, I really want to know who that guy is that's buried near that hole. I've heard about him, but nobody seems to know what it's all about. So I said, I'll do some research. I'll try to put together a presentation. So they kind of looked at scans, you know, the new guy, his uh, mother gave. So as you know, and this is for people who have, who are not that familiar with it, with Bill County. It's a lot of peninsula, but there's that little place in the middle, Peninsula State Park, you just zoom in, and right here is a golf course. And on that golf course was that memorial hole. Very colorful, uh, quite um, a monument. There's, uh, you can see it on this map, it's quite a ways back. There it is with a little circle around it. But off to the side over here is another monument that a lot of people do not even know is there. This is the picture of it. Huge stone, beautiful rock, and a, a plaque which is dedicated to Simon Bonamuse Concuegos. Head of the Tonic Army Indians. Now, this is a you know this is a little questionable head of the Tonic Army Indians. He never really did uh, claim to be one of the spokespersons. Well, I want to find out more about him, so I went to the nature center in the park and I inquired of Kathleen Harris, who was a naturalist there. She had a lot of information right away, and she showed me. A picture. This is Memorial Day of 1931. So as you can see, that golf course hardly has a tree on it. Uh, you can see the pole in the background. But you can see that that's absolutely covered with flivers. You know, this is the model keys and the cells and all kinds of... Uh, what we call antique cars, they were top of the line at that time. They were brand new, most of them. And they're just everywhere. Let's see a little bit more of that. And there was also a, a postcard, a colorized postcard with this group of very interesting, I mean, you look at the variety of headdresses and costumes. And, uh, and I wondered, could this Simon Coquillus have been involved in that? I have no idea. How would you identify him? Uh, and then I went to our historical society and I got a little envelope with some articles. Now, uh, you can see that this is from 1931. It's about his funeral, but this is from 1929, a talk that he gave in Kiwani. And it gave me a lot of information. Uh, it said uh, something about the place where he was born a village in Carlton, and I called Black Earth. Well, Black Earth, I thought, gee, that's over near Madison. But you know, Carlton had, he had to be closer here from things I've already read. Now, at the bottom, he said, it's now on the land where Joseph Bauer and Edward Fensel have established their homes. The 80 acres is where this village was. So, I went to the Google Maps and I put in Carlton. It brought me down near Kiwani, and I found out it's a township, just like Liberty Grove, a town, big square. And can you see down here? Anybody know what that is? Nuclear. That's the nuclear power plant. 
and key warning power plant. So this is nuclear road down here, and up here is Sand Bay Road. And this is Norman Road coming down. I thought, oh no, this is Norman Road. And I thought, gee, now all I have to do is find a river. Because you have to have a river to establish a village. So I kind of kept zooming in, and there's the river. They call it East Twin now. It used to be called the Michigan River. I said, well, this looks really good. This is, and then this is a little label I put in right there. You know, you've got some flat area for corn and then up, you know, the uplands keep out of the water in the flood season. And then I saw this farm and I saw that little road. Look at the name of the road. Bower Lane. So I said, bingo, this has got to be very close to the spot. Now, in, the, in those days, this is from 1909, the many, many native people would try to cash in on what Europeans perceived as India. <laughs> so here is a Potawatomi couple. Moonbeam, Karen. We have a moonbeam here. Not so, well, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. We really don't know. Uh, this may be a, a person who lives in this area. But, uh, but they are wearing Plains Indian garb. The headdress, the, the breastplates, that's all from the Sioux Indians. Because that was the image that Europeans expected. They said, oh, they, if you wore anything else, they said, oh, are you real Indian? <laughs> But this is a picture of Simon Coquitos. This is the one from which that plaque was taken, the picture on that plaque. Notice his headdress is very distinctive. It's, it's almost like a turban. There's one set of this. Very distinctive uh, decorations, very simple. And look at the pipe that he's holding. It has an unusual stem. This is another regalia that you often wore. It gives you a very good idea of the kind of uh, clothes that he felt would represent it in this people. We'll find out more about that coat he's wearing. This is another regalia that he often would wear. He was a very remarkable person because he mastered a very difficult language called English. <laughs> it's really a dreadful language. You know, the, all the ins and in and outs and the strange uh, idiomatic phrases and all. He, he did very well. Many people met, said that he did so much better than the Germans, the, the Belgians, and the Norwegians of his, of his day. This is another good picture of him. I think a little younger there. He's still wearing that, that jacket. But um, I was determined to find out more about him. I went down to that area. This is the East Twin River, and this is off to the left of that view. There's that big uh, open plain there, that, and there was a cornfield. Black earth <coughs> indicated it was a good place to grow corn. Uh, and then I continued down to Michigan because I heard of this man, Jim Sussman, and uh, I understood that he had done a lot of research. And uh, sure enough, you know, you can see fish mills. You may have been there. Is that the power plant? Those little bubbles is where I've located the the Makada Wagibok, which is Black Earth the village. <laughs> but down here is Michigan, and that's where Jim Sussman had established or helped to establish this museum. And uh, in that museum, I found quite a display. There is Simon Kikoyos. There's that picture we just looked at a minute ago. Uh, and there is, there are the cars, uh, there's that stone, and here is a young man who has been coming to help. Now you can see some of those pictures. He's been coming to help with their pumpkin parade in, in the fall. And he was a Potawatomi by the name of Earl Meshigan. Meshigan is the proper pronunciation of what Europeans mispronounce as Meshigan. So his great 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 grandfather was Abraham Meshigan, who uh, was very much a presence in that area, for whom that village was. There is with his wife, 
as a chef. And Jim Sussman also told me, well, you missed the sign. Because I told him I drove through there and I wasn't sure if that was, you know, exactly where things were. He said, you missed the sign. Well, sure enough, I did. It's not very uh, in your face, but this tells quite a bit about it. This is another way of pronouncing the name Makeda Wekamishkok. I found there about six different ways of putting that into letters. This is where um, Chief War Thunder lived and launched a raid to, to save the American revolutionaries at the Fort Detroit. So he helped to defeat the British. He, the Potawatomi had very good relationships with the French, and they hated the British because the British were always picking on the French. And they were always cheating them in their uh, feelings. And there you can see that sign, and you can see the Bower Farm just down the road. So it wasn't too far off. So here again is a good look. And I believe that this spot here was the site of the, the um, burial ground. That's what uh, is a, was a big issue for Simon Cordes. And we'll talk about that a little bit I uh, actually went up there a uh, couple of falls ago, and that's, that is that site. And as you can see, you don't see corn stubble. I don't even know if it's uh, a good place for growing its hay. But we'll find out a little bit more now. So then I also visited Kiwani. This is the jailhouse museum. I've never been in there. This is the history center right downtown. And there, it's just loaded with fantastic stuff from this whole, this area where Simon grew up. Uh, that is what uh, Simon explained on a visit, probably about 1925. This young man had found that in his uh, garden, wondering what it was. That looks like a picture of a horse. On the other, it's like a, kind of like a triangle. The other side, there's a man with a bow, and then there's a little picture of a, uh, it looks like a wikia. And Simon explained, oh, I know who, uh, who received that. He explained that it was a young couple, and that the chief had kind of imitated the, all this paper stuff and had created a deed stone to assure that they had the, uh, this wonderful place where they live. Here are all kinds of artifacts taken from that area of black earth that are in that, in that uh, museum. And here's a picture of a celebration that the Potawatomi Indians came to deliver at the uh, county fair. This, I think, would be 20, 1926. And over in the corner is Simon Now, I learned that, uh, that he ranged over this entire area. Uh, this is a representation of the little dwellings that were very common for the, uh, most of the Native Americans from the East Coast. They used all the Native materials uh, you can see that the lower level is rushes that have been woven together. They would have excellent insulation, and they will swell and seal so that they, they, they block the wind. It's really very good protection uh, during the winter. There's also a, a little gap at the top. The flat can be adjusted for the wind. Very, very efficient little house. This is at, at uh, Whitefish Dunes. They've deteriorated since this. This is about four years ago. These are kids from uh, the uh, uh, Boys and Girls Club, I'm just showing them around. And uh, so Whitefish Dunes is up here. This is the uh, Whitefish Creek, which flows out of Clark Lake. Uh, and there was somewhere in here, there was a village called Agua Shimagin. Mm -hmm or save our lives, and it's an interesting story behind that, but I don't think we have a path there. This is Mink River. This is the main place that Simon would spend most of his spring and summer. 
He was born in Makado Ohiko, down near Kiwani, but his grandfather and his father and mother would go up to this area of Mink River. That was a very special place to them for many reasons. And that's where they would spend their summers, most of his life. So he, he, when he was 14, things changed drastically. So these are some views of the beautiful Mink River Basin. Of course, this is a wonderful uh, aerial view, that one, that little point. And here's that same photo that Karen was just showing them. And uh, it, apparently, it was right around in here that their main village was. Um, still trying to get a good handle on that. And Karen shared some really important information. This is that census. Uh, you know, here's that old map. And from which some of the locations we can uh, tie down uh, much better. And you can see on this, uh, on this, there was a column for white and a column for colored, male and female. And the numbers at the top are totals. But you can see with each name, they would say how many males, how many females were in the household. And there is Indian Ben, three men, one woman. Indian Joe, two men, three women. So that's, yeah, that's quite a bit of information from that era. Um, and this is from Europe Lake uh, dugout canoe. And uh, I, I was unaware that there was a, and of course this wonderful basket that you have. So these are all very important indications that there was something going on in this area. Uh, and the, this is a great map that I think is in your handouts. Come on. So all of these spots are where there were archaeological sites established and where there have been some act there's been some active exploration. So, uh, and Mink River, of course, is not far from Washington Island, which used to be called Potawatomi Island. Very important. There's a book that just came out called um, uh, The Prophecy of the Wolf by a really wonderful author who lives in Sturgeon Bay, Tom Davis, who also wrote a book about the black colony on Washington Island. Uh, and it's, a, it's historical fiction. It includes a lot of the dynamics of what happened on Washington and Rock Island in the 1600s. So 1679, kind of what happened. The Onangu say that Simon used as his middle name is in honor of his great, 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 great grandfather, Onangu say, means the shimmering light of the sun. And he was very, one of the, he was the first Native American to be named in documents in the, on the Great Lakes. Very important person to take a look at. Beautiful. But again, imagine, let's see, imagine the trip that they would make all that way up the peninsula. This is a little uh, kind of a uh, museum display. It shows a little bit better what, the, what these dwellings at Makeda, what they would like to do with the winter dwellings are much more uh, stable and uh, uh, heavy construction. Uh, there were at least 200 of these at Black Earth. Uh, that's another, uh, you know, kind of a build or rebuild of what we call them. Demonstration model. And this is a nice uh, museum display. And you can see that there were a lot of appurtenances in there. It wasn't just a you know a bare earth couple. It was it had mats on the floor, it had benches along the sides, lots and lots of places to hang things. They would have corn and, and dried meat and use the in interior. And then they usually during the summer months they would have little shelters. So very nice representation, but there's one thing, uh, if this was pre-European contact, one thing that's out of place, can you spot it? The kettle, that little pot, 
Um, and I won't get down to explain right now, but I think I, I've, I'm on to something that's not really well recognized about the, uh, the enormous difference between Europeans, people of the old world, and people of the new. The Italian was not going to that. Uh, that village had been, uh, according to Simon's grandfather, that village had been there for 600 years on that, on that location. So that description that where they were, the Indians were given a reservation is not at all accurate. That was one place they were able to find a foothold with all these darn papers that people kept talking about. You know, one guy was on with all these green papers, and he, and he waved them in front of the guy with a whole bunch of white papers, and the guy would take green papers and give him the white papers, and suddenly he owned this land where they had lived for hundreds of years. I mean, can you grasp how difficult that was to understand? How the heck did that work? Now, when they came, when they left their village, they started north, it was about 1865. This is what the, the most of Door County looked like in 1865. The Civil War had ended, the guys came back, almost everybody from that area had been drafted or had enlisted in the Civil War. And one thing they wanted to do was work. Well, what was the main thing to do? Cut down the trees. So you can imagine the Potawatomi looking for their village, looking for the burial ground, looking for the food caches that they had left the year before, and finding this. Say, well, what is it? Is this, where, is this where we used to live? You know, it would be so disorienting. And then in 1871, this in the drying of the atmosphere was so intense because of all the trees that had been cut and all the slash that was on. It was like a wooden desert. And fires broke out in Chicago, in Peshtigo, in Nassawapi. You know, you know Tornado Park. And so at 1871, most of Simon's band decided, I'm afraid this our homeland is no longer our home. And they headed from Ellison Bay, according to Earl Meshiga, who has uh, oral histories, over to Cedar River. And at Cedar River, they tried to uh, make a home. But soon, a lot of Europeans showed up there, bringing their own ways and bringing diseases. And there was quite a die off of Simon's band. But a, a Chippewa who was a missionary had established with his wife deeds to property in this area that's called Hannibal, near Harris, Escanaba. So quite a few of, of his band settled in that area. Many others went on to Canada. Simon himself, now after all this mistreatment from his white neighbors, he somehow decided, well, I'm going to find out about what this is with all this green paper and, and, and jobs. And, and, and so he became what's called a cruiser. He would, he would identify the trees that were of value, and he would mark them for the lumber. And I kind of imagine him guiding him away from sacred spots. That's just my take. So he was in Canada, but then he got most of his work over the Martin Creek, Nama, St. Jacques, Rapid River. And so he spent a lot of time in Upper Michigan. And I always wondered now how did he get from Upper Michigan to Forestville, or to the Forest County Pottawa, which is where he, he passed away. So here is Blackwell, Wabano, there is Crandon, and uh, Leona is in, in that area. It turns out that he was a, he was writing letters to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. In 1906, he started writing letters. So he said, why are my people not receiving any payments? Here is 
and had the, uh, the bill, the numbers, you know, HR 5602, um, I've got the letter that, uh, that they wrote. And uh, in 1807, he got a reply. The reply was, we'll get back to you. Uh, <laughs> in 1808, they said, oh, we we'll look into this. And you're in Michigan. This is for Wisconsin people. Even though he had uh, been involved in some of the negotiations, even at that early date. So he began to make contacts with the people in this area. He, he lived in Wasaki. Many of his early letters are from Wasaki. Turns out there is a big lumber company that was there. And they would all, often say, bird camp. Well, Mr. Bird was the, the, uh, the overseer of that lumber mill there. Uh, he worked for J.W. Uh, Wells Lumber Company, which was located in the mountain. But eventually he made uh, contact with the leaders of the Potawatomi who were in this area. Most of them had come from Kansas. Most of them were from the, originally their ancestors were from Chicago, Milwaukee, uh, you know, Illinois, Indiana, and had been driven uh, on what they called the Trail of Death. From that area out to Kansas, Iowa, some of them end, uh, ended up in, in uh, Oklahoma. Well, but a lot of them, when the agent wasn't looking, they started heading north. And they have, there are many places where they, uh, where they stopped. The, the real interesting places. I think another reason that he uh, was attracted to that area is there was a good railroad connection. So he was a cruiser, a lumber cruiser, and he became a surveyor. Now with a lumber cruiser, he had to be writing and, you know, right on the, the square footage and surveyor, he had to be keeping notes and establishing lines and, I mean, that's very, that's very sophisticated work. Uh, he was completely self-taught. He had picked up English as a very young child. His father was skilled at it, but passed away when he was about five years old. But he followed his pattern, picked up English, picked up from his children's books, reading and writing. So he would take the train down to Madison meet with uh, all kinds of politicians, historians. Uh, he would stay in Green Bay with the Blesch family, almost always. We have an interesting story of, but he made three trips to Washington, D.C. I mean, imagine, he pretty much funded himself with all this. It was a huge trip. But he met with uh, Thomas Frank Connor, the uh, congressman from 1911 to 1917, and together they they hammered out a, an agreement that, that that gave some compensation to this group who had pretty much stayed when all the others were sent out to Kansas. They had stayed in Upper Kiwani, Manitoba, and Door County, and uh, so it, it was a sizable. Uh, settlement that came out to about ten dollars per person per month. Uh, this is another picture of a, a meeting that he had at the, the uh, county fair. This is a picture of a man named George Wing. In 1921, they were connected to uh, through some other people, and but found that they had known each other in childhood. George said to Simon said. There were kids that would shoot apples out of the air with a bow and arrow for a nickel. He said, oh yeah, that was me. <laughs> that was a good shot. And uh, George invited him to stay with him for an entire summer, 1921. This is another regalia that he often would wear. But this is a book which I have right here. Uh, Karen really wants to get her fingers in it. Yes. I'm thinking about it. Uh, so George Wink wrote articles, and this is a compilation of all these articles that were in the newspapers. Most of it is about the history of the towns and the, and the leaders, uh, but a good quarter of this book are, 
uh, stories that he picked up from Simon about the history of Native Americans. Also, through that book, I was able to trace back Simon's her uh, inheritance. So, uh, because it mentions, my grandfather said this, and his father told him this. And so it brings Simon clear back to Onan Jose, who lived from about 1640 to maybe 1710. A lot of guesswork in <coughs> But, um, you know, there's a great deal of travel involved. Uh, we know that the Iroquois came from the Mississippi area. They followed the Ohio River, came up here, and began displacing many other people because they were so organized. Uh, and a whole different culture. They were probably the ones that introduced corn to all the other tribes. So eventually, the uh, Potawatomi, the Chippewa, and the Ottawa, Odawa, were driven further and further west. Um, and they have many legends about how that happened. But Onamuse meant this gentleman, who we know as Robert LaSalle, uh, his real name is about six miles long, and he was a very ambitious man. He was also quite a linguist. He spoke Chinese, Arabic, English, German. Uh, he spoke about nine languages when he came to the Americas. And he picked up the Algonquian languages, of which Potawatomi is one grand. Uh, and also he picked up the, the languages of the Iroquois, which is totally different language. And, uh, but he really wanted to establish trade for the French. And he built the first ship. This is probably a very uh, artistic license. It might have been a swoop. But this is the artist's idea of the ship that he built right uh, downriver from Niagara Falls on the shore of Lake Erie. And then from there, he took that ship through this very narrow spot, all because of what he could understand from the Native Americans, all the way up there. And he sent word ahead that he wanted to collect furs to establish a uh, journey of expedition. The king of France wouldn't help him. So this is Washington Island. This is the realm of Onangusé. He was the, the primary leader. And had probably established with the Menominee the, uh, the possession of this whole area here. Primarily for the Potawatomi, but also the Chippewa and Odawa, they were all very close to the uh, But unfortunately, that Griffin, this great ship, was filled with furs, headed back east. Robert LaSalle took canoes and went down south, and the Griffin vanished. We still don't know what happened. It has never, the wreckage has never been discovered. So that's, that is a heritage of, uh, of Simon, the reason that that name is very important, and I'm uh, This is another picture of Simon de Pregos, and one of the uh, officials in Kiwani, I believe. Another picture of him with a friend of his. I love this picture, where he's relaxing. He and this little boy must be watching something very interesting. This, uh, some people are thinking this is a picture of his grandfather, Quintos, very, very famous leader. But Quintos died in 1869, and I don't think there were too many photographers out there. And there could be a This is a real important picture. These are some of the great leaders of that area. This is Abraham Meshigad, uh, whose father was the namesake of Michigan. Um, this is uh, Juan de Seco, very famous leader. This is David Nsawaquet, or True Fork. He was the greatest hunter, and he was Simon's stepfather. When his father died, his mother didn't marry this man. He was a very excellent guy. This is uh, David Kishek. This is Ben uh, Akimi. And we're pretty sure that his name uh, 
Simon Dawes is referred to him as Dr. Ben, and he stuck pretty close to Dorcan. He, he died in uh, near Blackwell, a uh, place called Taylor Falls. But pretty, he may be the one referred to as Indian Ben on those, uh, on those uh, documents. We, and we think that Ben was, uh, Ben Aki was married to Indian Joe Savi's daughter. Uh, yeah. We think. Simon mentions Joe Savi quite a bit in his letters. And uh, this um, is also David from Sarawakwet. And this may be Simon's mother. No, this one will probably be Simon's mother. That may be Simon's wife. Meshi Meshi Kwa, or She Puma. Yeah, that's a very impressive name. The, uh, the only person named is the man that he resembles. In the, the title of that JPEG, this picture that I found on the internet, says David Nsawakwet. Now, Simon was able to visit Kiwani and his place of birth at Simon in 1922. And he and George Wayne and several other people got mad. You'll find that on hand up. They were dead set on preserving that burial ground, putting a plaque because of the, uh, the Civil War or the Revolutionary War. He wrote war thunder. So they made all these plans in 1922. This is just a follow-up of that article. This is an example of Simon's handwriting. This uh, is a series of documents in which he is taking the words of James Wamani Seko, who was a prominent leader in the Baltimore area, and he is uh, dictating his story for him. And getting some of these, uh, these are people who were leaders at that time. And uh, he, so he would uh, do this to inform these in, uh, interesting historical figures or people involved in history. The head of the Wisconsin Historical Society, Charles Brown, received a lot of letters I've, I've heard from him. Also, Charles Brogan, uh, who is lost and mentions him very uh, frequently. And then J.P. Schumacher, who did a lot of archaeological work. These are some more letters that are in Green Bay archives. About 40 letters in uh, I've got the whole collection right here. I just took my little camera and my telephone, my telephone, like the old spy in the movies, and, uh, and I took pictures of them all. He also gave the, uh, the names, the Potawatomi names, or I should say the Neshnabe names. Now their name for themselves was Neshnabe. Potawatomi is a mispronunciation of Bodewatomi, which means the keepers of the fire. The Wa is the keeper. So Chippewa, they were the keepers of the spirit. And Udawa, they were the keepers of diplomacy. So they each had a uh, distinctive role to play. Uh, so a lot of these are interesting. The one that's most interesting to me, well, I knew, I heard Mago Shikani was the name of Fish Creek. It means a good place to come fishing. But Egg Harbor, the name is Chepeye Skidami. Ghost Harbor, or I even just saw it, Ghost River. And as you know about the little creek that runs along behind Chief Oshkosh, it goes down, bubbles, bubbles down through that little valley and then disappears. There's a huge berm that the, because of the currents, this berm was thrown up centuries ago and it's all boulders and the river just disappears. I think that's probably that's Well, Simon came back to see what has happened with this plant, put up the plant memorialized that burial ground. And in 1925, June 26, 1925, 
he found that his friend, George Wing, had died. Uh, no one had notified him. It's been over a year since he passed away. Couldn't find anyone that was, knew anything about this plan. He went to the site and it had been plowed and planted. Completely terrible, terrible disappointment. This is in May 23rd, 1927. He wrote to Joseph Lansky, who was the clerk in Q1. And uh, he said, just a line to let you know that my condition today, I am very poor now. I have nothing to eat someday. I have no friends to support me. You probably know yet I am old. I was born at Kiwani County a week today, 76 years ago. I am not able to work anymore. If you will uh, be kind to help me a little something to eat, to live. About the most pathetic missive you can imagine. This is in 1927, in May. Well, it couldn't have been much more than two or three weeks after that, this guy showed up. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hjalmar Poland. He was the founder of the Historical Society here, and a great writer, and he had met Potawatomians tending his orchard. And uh, this is his home below the tower. It was, uh, it, you know, it was taken apart when the uh, park, when it became a park. Even the big opponents of the park, thinking that it would just be neglected and all burned. I believe this is him. Yeah, yeah, man. And but this is like a, a dream home for him. That, that location was very precious to him. But he finally he uh, worked a deal with the state, and this is the home that he built. This is the way it is now, um, after leaving that spot. This is on Poland Lane, just next to that little new little uh, three-hole golf course. And I found out that uh, Simon was indeed there at the ceremonial pole. Mr. Holland had the idea to recognize the, the uh, occupation of the Potawatomi Indians. It's the first land acknowledgement, perhaps, of this certainly in Great Lakes. And he asked Simon to come and officiate. This has got to be just weeks after that letter was sent, where he was really at the bottom. He was so disappointed with the, what had happened in Hawaii. I'm sure he didn't know what to think of this thing and this idea of pole, which. Uh, but this is indeed Simon Kukudos right here. And you can tell because of the jacket that he's wearing. This is a Civil War jacket that a uh, friend had given to him. And he had it embroidered with these very wooden Indian designs. And it's, it's now in Madison, but at, in Forest County, there's a little cabin with all these mock-ups. This is a vest. There's a pipe, hat. These are all place keepers. Because Madison says, oh, I don't know if you guys can take care of these. These are very special. So they've been upgrading their museum with fire protection and climate control. Uh, I think with, with this in mind. To, uh, but notice again, May 23rd, 1927, this is August 1927. So he showed up in style with all these people, uh, many of whom he really didn't know that well because uh, they were the folks from coming up from Kansas. Uh, and at the end of the day, they, they put them all up for free in hotels. Many of them were at Jay uh, Holman's home and Yalmar. When they were ready to leave, they gave them $100 to so be sure they had enough for their trip back. They had to come by an uh, open truck over the road, the 1927 roads <laughs> from Sturgeon Bay. There was a train connection to Sturgeon Bay from 
So, how did he attract the attention of so many people? Why did they come? It really is a mystery. And when he the father, of the fourth country, we want to know there is the casket that Charles Broughton provided for the Simon. There again is that picture. Here's another picture of that day. And the cars that are just swamping that area. And now, I'm going to do a little switcheroo. If this week, if we had internet, I could have just gone right into this. So believe it or not, there were cameramen then at that event. I have seen little bits and pieces of this, and they were very murky, very hard to see anything, but there's been a tremendous restoration Searching on the handout table, there are uh, brochures from the Forest County oh. Museum that they've been upgrading so that really? the State Historical Society will recognize them as a safe place for the artifacts. You found what you need? Yep, this is the little museum in Hannaville, Upper Michigan. 
presided over at that time by Earl Meshagad, who found out for sure, I mean, he found the documentation that Simon was his other great-great-grandfather. So Simon's daughter, Agnes, is his great-great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. So he's really both of those illustrious this is the interior of that museum. Really, one of the work. This is going to be very endangered because of its black ash and those those darn uh, emerald ash borders. Don't know the difference between the black ash and the white ash. And the green. Now, now we're in Forest County, over near Crandon, and this is their museum and library. This is the library over here. Wonderful collection of books. Great folks. This is some of the, the, the museum. Well worth the visit. Uh, it's been revamped quite a bit. The notice, there is Simon. There he is uh, on big display. And there's a very, very enthusiastic, very well-educated and a community of young people there that are really interested in their own history likely to be our next wave of tourists. So it would be, be really good for us to bone up a little bit on, on this, the history of this people and so we know what to, where to direct them. And maybe put up some markers here and there. Okay. So that is about it. I've got lots of more things. Simon, it's very difficult to fit, you know, in a short evening preservation. Uh, presentation. Oops. Um, Jamie, would you put that on? The, um, all the materials that you mentioned in the, in the handouts hopefully will guide you in, in your search if you want to know more, but does anyone have any questions while we've got the expert here? <laughs> <laughs> when did the tribes start naming their children English names? And well, Simon was John. Was right, that became kind of a fad about the time of his birth. You find all these different, there was Simon Pokagon over in South Bend, Indiana, who was a very important leader. They realized that these poor Europeans were having that. Heck of a trying to pronounce their the proper names. And they usually will have, only have one. You notice Simon had, Simon, when I was here, he noticed all the important people had three names, not just two. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they wanted to be sure they were the one and only Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, which is my dad's name. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was an effort to bridge the gap. And apparently his father was a, uh, had a very bright personality and was very popular among the, the immigrants, the European immigrants. Uh, in good sense of things, there's some indications that uh, he was bridging the gap, but he wasn't there when, that, when the village was evicted by the sheriff and 16 deputies heavily armed. They, the, um Missionaries also were converting and baptizing a lot of the natives. And so they would choose a, what we would call an American name from the Bible. Well, they, by they the usually refer to it as a Christian name. Yes, a Christian name. Of course, it's Hebrew. Yep. John and Daniel and David and Simon, those are all. That's why I got a kick out of finding Mosquito as, as one of the names, you know, buying things at Sam Rogers' store in Raleigh's Bay. Well, it probably was a mispronunciation of his, he was trying to give him his real name. Well, I still think it's a good, good name. <laughs> Uh, you had a question too. David, you alluded to your surprise that that many people came at that time in our economic 
tragedies. Do you have a sense of what really sparked all of those people? This was not a very easy place to get to. Well, Simon had been giving talks all over the state of Wisconsin, okay. mostly in the eastern section, but Lake Geneva, there's a report of a great talk that he gave. Kiwani, uh, Madison, he knew all these historians. Uh, so he had a lot of credibility as a speaker. And historical societies were just starting to form in, in the 1920s. You know, the battle just to get the harvest in. You know, it was kind of, you kind of have to, we're, you know, had that out of the way. They would become settled, and they said, gee, was that your grandfather that did this, or was that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and they started sorting out their own history, and then Simon showed up speaking English and explaining things, and I'm sure a lot of them were hoping to have him come, and then he's gone. Dalmore Holland was a, a phenomenal publicity man. He knew how to use the newspapers. The newspapers were very, very well read. It was the internet in those days. These mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. newspapers were just have. And they'd share. So if, oh, you, yeah. if you published an article in Sturgeon Bay, it might be reprinted in Indiana, mm -hmm. where other Potawatomi, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the first volunteer rolled off the assembly line in 1917. Ten years. Ten years before. So they were just a new hot item. Even though people were beginning to feel the uncertainty of the Great Depression suddenly coming, you know, getting the chaos uh, The whole idea of Canada, and I just got a book from my uh, brother-in-law about uh, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and uh, a naturalist, famous naturalist, and, and, and the guy who had the fire, the, I think Firestone, they all went on this huge camping trip with reporters in tow. And the newspapers were full of these camping trips they were making in the newfangled automobile and how they were able to get through the swamp <laughs> with their uh, you know, rubber tires. And probably a little help from the horses farmer next door. <laughs> yeah, you know, those camping trips where uh, was the event that caused uh, D Detroit to almost be created in Kiwani. Well, somebody found a sparkly stone and thought it was gold. Oh. <laughs> and Kiwani really, yeah, this, that's a very interesting story. Yeah. Their the Astros invested. Was there another yeah. question? Um, did you have a target date for the publishing of your book? Well, sometime in the century. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks it's like huge. It's a huge challenge, huge far challenge and I, I wish you hadn't mentioned this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm imagining the book, and I've got some chapters written, but there's going to be problems with permission for photographs. Mm. They're okay. In a voluntary, you know, mm -hmm. on a voluntary basis, talk, for but in a book, yeah. And almost all books are now self-published, mm -hmm. and I'm very poor <laughs> to the front end. Um, but I'm in touch with that with some experienced writers and encouraging. We'll see what happens. <coughs> and I don't have a PhD. So. That doesn't matter. Well, I, well, I have an honorary PhD from Sweetnuts. Well, there you go. I have no less. I just have to document. Very good. Did I see another hand? Of Very funny. Um, those of us who knew Virginia Hansen may know this story. When she was a little girl, she actually attended that event. Her parents took her there, oh. and Virginia died a year ago this last weekend. Um, would have been 98 this year, 97 this year, but she was there as a little girl. And she is the one responsible for passing on our valuable artifacts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she preserved it, and I think she is responsible for stabilizing it. Mm -hmm. 
So Simon's uh, legacy lives on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a, uh, I've been trying to track down who was the young woman who was asked to sing by the, the tribe because she had a wonderful voice and could sing the national anthem in Nation of Bay in, uh, in, the, in their language. And she, at the, at the pool, there were at least a thousand people, maybe three thousand. And so she stepped forward on that little stage and she just froze. She could not get a peep out. And Simon came and put his arm around her and began to sing with the children. But he sang the whole national anthem. And she went and went. That's why he is our guest speaker. <laughs> well, I just keep repeating, you know, we know, we know who we got. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There you go. <laughs> that, that's well, and that's what's fascinating useful. about the way they spell the name. When I started, I asked the uh, preser tribal preservation officer at Forest County, do I use the hyphenated spelling, the one where it's all squished together? And, and he said, well, it depends which book you're using <laughs> as your reference. And I found that if you take the hyphenated one, you can sound it out no matter what language you're speaking. So I thought well, that was interesting. But there were German, French, yeah. and English linguists. Right. And as I said, Carcados, I believe that, that second A should be uh, long A sound. So, Carcados, please. And I have yet to speak with the elders. The, 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 the fluent speakers, but the young gentleman said, Well, in my experience, that would be the way to And when you start doing research, I um, shift the first time I <laughs> get confirmation from the elders. Yes. And and one of the early books is the Jesu Jesuit um, reports from America. And if they spent a winter, wintered over with a tribe, they would correct some of their spellings and say, no, 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 that's not what it is, if you listen carefully. So I see another hand back there. Uh, David, I, I'm just amazed at uh, your passion mm -hmm. for, for all this history. And I, I thank you for yeah. all that you put into it. And you really brought a lot well, to, it's been to a, what I, uh, I want to Most of my heart. For many years, I heard a Mohawk speaker in um, 1968 explain the, the relationship of the Mohawk Great Law of Peace and the Constitution of the United States. And I was just absolutely flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. So much to learn. Because uh, it wasn't in my history books in high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are yes. 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 And, the, and again, the, the kinship, I was amazed that relatives of Indian Joe and Indian Ben are scattered all the way, were scattered all the way along the Michigan shore down to uh, Sheboygan and Kiwani and, you know, Simon was Joe's cousin. That one we know, even the elders and everybody yeah, agreed that. spent a great deal of time. Yeah. Explain the connections and where did so and so pass away? Yeah. We, we moved, there were a lot of them were at the Leelanau County in Lower Michigan. And he tells us how many children they had. What, what a resource. Yeah. I mean, he was the and starting. This is just the one collection of letters from, that he wrote to George Wing and then the successor to George Wing. And I'd love to find more caches of these letters. I don't know if my car is going to hold it out that long for me. Well, thank you for sharing what you've already found. Thank you so much.